A continuación, damos inicio a la agenda académica del día de hoy. La agenda académica de este congreso tendrá una nutrida exposición de importantes temas. Daremos inicio con dos conferencias magistrales. Posteriormente, daremos paso a seis sesiones académicas que se desarrollarán hoy y mañana, en las cuales contaremos con una o dos conferencias centrales y un panel de análisis conformado por empresarios, consultores y representantes de empresas nacionales, internacionales y el gobierno nacional. Al final de la tarde del día de hoy tendremos cuatro importantes conferencias. Damos así inicio a las dos conferencias magistrales denominadas Tendencias Energéticas Mundiales a cargo del doctor Walt Hart, vicepresidente de IHS Market de Estados Unidos y del doctor Alberto Fosa, CEO de New and Creative de Brasil. Les damos la más cordial bienvenida, los invitamos a subir al escenario. Le damos la palabra al doctor Walt Hart, vicepresidente de IHS Market de Estados Unidos. Gracias. Buenos días. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's a very, very great honor to be able to speak here. I'm sorry I can't make the presentation in Spanish, but uh, I really do appreciate the honor to come and a, and a special thanks to uh, Alejandro Martinez for, for allowing me to come. Alejandro asked me to speak on the global energy trends, the really, really big picture. And so uh, that's, that's what I've set out to do. Um, I, I work for IHS Market. We're a global consultancy and uh, researching firm. And I'll, I'll talk just a, just a couple of quick slides for those who are not familiar with our organization. Then we'll jump right into the mega trends that are some of the things that are impacting our industry today and into the future. And then, you know, it is an LPG conference, so then I'll try to link it back into what, what that means for, for LPG. Okay. So just a quick note on IHS market. So a, a lot of you who, who do know us may know, it, may know us for our, our LPG information. You may know that we've had uh, LPG seminars for, this will be actually, we're, we're, it'll be 25 years this year for our annual LPG seminar. But we have a lot of other, uh, business areas as well. We have 14,000 colleagues worldwide in over 120 offices and more than 50,000 customers. And we cover more than just uh, LPG. We cover all the areas of energy. We have chemicals, automotive, uh, aerospace, defense, um, financials. And so it's actually quite a large organization. Um, a lot of you may know me from the, the Pervin and Gertz days when we had 100 employees worldwide in that consultancy, but it's a very different world. So the group that I represent and uh, spend most of my time in is the, is the NGL group, which includes LPG. Um, we have three basic business areas. The one you may know is our seminar and workshop areas. This year we're going to be in, in, uh, in Quito, Ecuador. That's going to be the 12th through the 14th of November. It's the first time there for us. We're really looking forward to it, and it's our 25th year, as I mentioned before. But we also do um, publications, uh, for instance, our, our long-term NGL market service, um, waterborne LPG, we keep track of all the LPG ships. Um, and then we also have bespoke consulting, and that's really the third business area. So if you have questions on that, let me know. I don't want to belabor this. So let's get right into the mega trends that we were talking about. So first, Uh, you, you can't really separate the energy business from the economy. And so you need to talk about the economy. And, and the truth of the matter is that the global economic growth is slowing. And you can see from the graphic here that there's a big V. You know, the big V was the last big recession that we had. That was around 2008, 2009. Um, what you can also see, if you look at where the vertical line is around 20, you know, 2018, 2019, is that things are going downhill. You know, the, The growth in GDP is, is, uh, is declining. Part of that is due to my home country's president, Mr. Trump, because he's got a lot of very interesting policies that are um, stirring things up, not the least of which are the tariffs. The Trump tariffs are slowing global trade, particularly with the U.S. and China, but also with other areas of the world, and that is certainly not helping any. Uh, our, our economists estimate that we've probably lost a half a GDP point 
for the first round of tariffs and they expect another maybe quarter point for the second round of tariffs. So it's really, really not helping. But it's not the only area of concern either. So for example, China you know, the, is, is, uh, has particularly problems with shadow banking. Um, also, the countries are very highly leveraged. The more growth slows, the more vulnerable they are to a shakeup. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the UK's Brexit situation. They have a new uh, prime minister. He wants to go out either with or without a deal by October 31st. That could uh, cause problems for the European economies. Uh, Mr. Trump came out with a bunch of US tax cuts, which temporarily boosted the economy, but there were no offsetting spending cuts. And so he's leaving that for my grandchildren to be able to pay for. Uh, Trump uh, is also pressuring the Fed to lower interest rates, uh, and which is going to limit the ability to pull out of a recession later on, you know, when the inevitable recession comes. A lot of people think the Italian sovereign debt crisis is even a big, more problematic, uh, pr more problematic than the Brexit problems. Here in Latin America, we certainly have problems uh, too. You know, there's the you know, Venezuelan crisis, you know, they're in depression. Argentina's in recession. There's just a lot of things going on. And I don't mean all doom and gloom, and our, our economists don't predict a recession in the next few years, but it's something to watch, and there's a lot of a higher risk. Another global trend, I, I'm not a political scientist. My PhD is in chemical engineering. It's not in political science. Um, but when we look at uh, you know, populism, this is a, a situation where, where um, governments are being ruled by folks who identify with a particular group they kind of consider the true people of the country. And this comes from a Tony, you know, Tony Blair study. Uh, and and what, what the other problem that comes up is that then these people who, who get in charge of the nation are really looking to uh, be able to enforce the will of the people. And sometimes that means undermining democratic principles and, and you know, make things more you know, autocratic. And so that can create some problems. And, and the reason I bring this up is that uh, they did their study was conducted at the end of 2018. Um, what, they, what they found out was that the number of leaders who were uh, populous has increased from around, you know, has increased fivefold since 1990 through the end of 2018. And you look, and some of these are the most, uh, some of the most influential countries you know, in the world. And so it's, it's really concerning because it can undermine uh, democratic principles, lends countries towards autonomy, and then makes it very difficult to, to uh, we have global problem with, China, uh, with, with climate change, and this makes it more difficult to address problems like that. So let's talk now about, about energy and, and, and chemicals for that matter. What you see on the left-hand side is global refined product demand. And so this is looking, this goes out to 2040. And what you may notice, uh, you know, without staring at the details, is that it levels off. So what, you know, what does that mean? That means that basically that the demand for transportation fuels is leveling off. And, and that includes feedstocks that go into chemicals. Now on the right-hand side, you see a comparison of the growth since 2012 of petrochemical products versus refined products. And of course, it's just like on the left-hand side, you can see the refined products levels off, but the demand for petrochemicals increases rather steadily all the way through the forecast. Now, you know, why is that important? It's important because the huge majority of petrochemical feedstocks come from, you know, come from, from refining. And particularly, so you look on the left-hand side, these are the global ethylene feedstocks by uh, percentage for, for, you know, for 2018. And what you see that it's about 40% naphtha, about 40% ethane, and about 13% LPG with some smaller ones as well. Now the problem with naphtha is that it's about 85% coming from refining directly, and then another, say, 7, 8% that's coming from associated gas. Now associated gas is associated with the production of crude oil, the reason you produce crude oil is to put it into refineries, and so if you're going to, you know, cut back on, you know, refined, you know, refined products growth, then that means associated gas is going to level off as well. So the concern then is that if 40% of feedstocks are based on naphtha, and naphtha is beginning to level off, then, you know, incremental naphtha is going to become very scarce, and the petrochemical industry is going to be looking for other feedstocks. And that probably means more pressure, you know, on LPG longer term. And you know, 
if you want to just look for a, an example, here's, you know, just pulled one out of the news here in the last few days. So this is Reliance. This is the big private uh, refiner in, in India. And you may know that Jamnagar is the world's largest refinery. And so, you know, the, the, what their plan is then is to produce only jet fuel and petrochemicals at the world's largest refinery. You know, so this is an important trend. It's something to watch because it means more refineries are going to be moving towards producing petrochemicals and less towards transportation fuels. So we look at world crude and condensate production outlook, and if, if, you know, if your refining has to level off, that means your, your crude production is also going to level off, and you see that's likely to occur around, around 2030. And so a lot of LPG production is linked to that, and that's important. Now, what's also important is to look on a regional trend, because a lot of the LPG we get here in Latin America is now coming incrementally from the United States. So this is the US and Canada supply outlook. And what you see is that the production falls off more quickly than you see on the, on the global refined products demand. Why is that? It's not because of a lack of, uh, of, of demand, really. It, it's really driven by maybe the playing out of the uh, oil plays, the shale plays in the United States and in Canada in the long term. So it's still a peak of around 2030, but it's going to drop off. And longer term, that means that more of the LPG is going to be coming from other areas besides the US. What about natural gas? So the balance of LPG is mostly taken from natural gas. What we see for natural gas is basically steady demand, steady increase, just like uh, petrochemicals. And a lot of that is coming from the United States and Canada because we have a lot more uh, gas reserves than we have for oil reserves. Now. So let's switch over. What does this mean for LPG? Okay. So as I've implied before, LPG basically comes from three sources. It comes from refining, it comes from associated gas, and it comes from non-associated gas. And associated gas is, is linked with refining. So if refining starts to level off, associated gas is going to start to level off. And so what you see on the left-hand side is global LPG by source, and it just breaks it out to refining versus all natural gas. And I can tell you that basically all of that growth is coming from, uh, from non-associated gas in the longer term. And so that's important. You know, the, the problem with associated gas versus non-associated gas is associated gas has a higher concentration of LPG in it. And if, uh, if it's going to be leveling off, then that puts more pressure on non-associated gas to be able to provide the LPG that we need in the, in the long term. You look at the right-hand side, where is that LPG going to come from? Well, basically, it's four regions, the US and Canada. It's going to come from the Middle East, from Russia, and from, and from China and India, and particularly China. Now, that Chinese material is basically going to stay put. They're not going to send that overseas. And the, you know, the biggest amount of LPG going waterborne is going to be from the US and Canada and then from, uh, from the Middle East. We've seen already, because of the US shale development, big changes in flows of, uh, over the water. We tried to push it into Latin America first, but essentially the Latin American market is saturated with US material. We tried to send it into Europe next because it's the next most proximate, but it's really a quite competitive region. So our last increment has to go to Asia. And because it has to go to Asia, we have to be able to cover that arbitrage. And that means that our prices in the US has to stay below the rest of the global benchmarks. And that's good news for Latin America because it really helps with good availability at a low price. So why is it that the US has so much LPG to be able to ship out? Well, you look on the left-hand side and you can see our demand, residential, commercial, refinery, auto gas, other fuel, et cetera. And then the dark black line is the, is the production. And what you can see is that, you know, starting about the beginning of the shale boom, we were very close to balance, but now we produce so much that we just can't have it grow. Um, we just can't be able to take it all domestically. Residential commercial is losing to natural gas. You have, for chemicals, you have uh, ethane that's, that's uh, most of the plants that are being built are ethane-based plants. Refinery and auto grass isn't really growing. So whatever surplus we have has to be exported, and that's also good news for Latin America. You look on the right-hand side, and what you see is that the U.S. now is very easily the largest exporter in the world, and that's likely to increase in the medium to short long term. What about the demand side? So you look on the left-hand side, what should jump out to you is that big blue wedge, and that's Asia Pacific. 
So Asia Pacific is growing much faster than other regions of the world. Um, you know, the other Americas contains Latin America. There is a small increase there, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. On the right-hand side, it's broken down by country rather than by region. And I think it's interesting to see that the U.S. is flat, and so it's not increasing. And where the big growth is is really China and India, really driving most of the big growth for the whole world. You hear things about Bangladesh, Myanmar, but they don't compare to the growth that you see in China and India. So we look at it by end use. Certainly residential and commercial demand is increasing uh, steadily. Um, most of the other forms of premium demand aren't growing that quickly. And, but the problem is that the supply is growing much faster than demand. You need a market clearing mechanism. That's where chemicals comes in to help to clear the market. On the right hand side, we look just specifically at Northeast Asia. I mentioned that Asia has to be able to pick up the, basically has to clean the slate. And so what you see on the very bottom is Northeast Asia outside of mainland China. So this is Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Mongolia, et cetera. And it's effectively flat. All of the growth in Northeast Asia is coming from China. And it's a mixture of residential and commercial demand and of chemical demand. And you hear particularly about this propane dehydrogenation, this PDH demand. And you can see that that's responsible for a lot of the growth coming up. So the question is, you know, the, the problem is that we have some of the biggest countries in the world where the demand is starting maybe to, to level off after, you know, the U.S. is already bored flat. You look at China, basically there's competition with LNG that's starting to, to, to make that, uh, you know, slow down. Um, India is certainly growing very quickly right now, but we think by the late 20s, you're going to start to see that growth start to slow because of saturation. Um, Indonesia is already starting to slow down their growth. Um, and Brazil, you know, is, is, has, a, has a very high level of saturation. So where is this growth going to come from in the future? On this, we see GDP per capita, which is a affordability measure versus residential commercial consumption per capita. So how much we're really being used. You look at the right-hand side of the graph and you look at countries like Brazil and China and you say, well, they can afford to use it and they're using it. And, you know, but there's also some degree of maturation in that area. You look on the lower part, people who can afford it, but they're not using it, usually it's competition. A lot of times that's with natural gas. Now on the closer side, people who can afford it, there are still markets that use a whole lot of it. Usually that's driven by subsidies. And then you see a lot of really small circles, which we euphemistically call high potential. And what you see there is that they're small. Now what, what happens for those to be able to grow? Usually that means that the, they either have to get richer or you have to put subsidies in place. And so it's very difficult to grow without those two situations. There are some other areas of trending. Michael mentioned these earlier, Michael Kelly. On the left-hand side, you see LPG for bunker fuel. Now, the truth of the matter is that there aren't that many ships that are being converted over to LPG. Uh, here's an example, Exmar, building them for Equinor, the uh, used to be um, Stat Oil. They're not going to be ready until 2021, so those are new builds. There's another you know, four to six uh, conversions that are going on, but really that's about it. So it's, it's, it's something to watch, but it's not a, I wouldn't call it a huge trend just yet. LPG for power generation. So this project on the right-hand side in Ghana is, uh, is a marquee project. There are no others like it right now. Um, most of the projects we see are probably less than five megawatts, but it's certainly, it's certainly gonna help. I think the big projects that people are looking for are, are more scarce, but hopefully we'll hear differently from Christoph later on. So I'm going to leave you with some global trends to think about that I pulled from this presentation. So we look first on the, on the global megatrends. The first is the economies. Global economies are slowing. There's an increased risk of recession. We don't think it's going to happen right away, but recession is inevitable. You know, it will come and that's going to slow, going to slow the market down. So you hear a lot about climate change. You know, our our U.S. president is a climate skeptic. Uh, most people believe in the science that, that, uh, that there is problems with climate change. Um, but I think I put in responses. It's really the response to climate change that you have to worry about because if we don't do anything about it, then you really can't expect any change. And then you see populism is the next route. So the, the next uh, bullet point, um, populism is something that would keep us from making progress on, on, on climate change because it makes countries focus on basically their own problem, less likely to work together to solve this, you know, this global climate change problem. 
Um, natural gas, petrochemical demand is showing steady, you know, steady growth. You know, the natural gas will help to produce more LPG in the future, but the, you know, but the petrochemical demand is going to be able to pull more LPG. So, the, you know, I guess the good news for there is we're going to have a natural market clearing mechanism. Um, the bad news is, is that particularly if PDH units are what's going to be driving that demand, then that might be able to raise the prices of LPG and make it a little bit less available to developing economies. This crude oil to chemicals that we saw as an example from the uh, reliance. This is uh, something that we should see is kind of the future of refining. Um, that reliance project is not the only example out there. There's a lot of people really looking at that. From LPG trends, supply growth is mainly coming from non-associated gas in the, in the, in the long, long term. Incremental LPG demand is going to be mostly coming from Asia. Um, if the U.S. And, uh, and is, is going to have to be sending it to, to Asia, that surplus LPG is going to have to be traveling long distances. And so that should lend support for more LPG ships if, uh, if we can you know, develop those technologies. And then finally, chemical de feedstock demand is going to continue to clear the market. You know, right now, that's flexible olefins cracker. In the future, it might become PDHs, which might support the prices. So I'll leave you with that, and I thank you for your attention.